morning. I'm Spot on Weather meteorologist Matthew Euler, and welcome to part two. We're going to do part two of the vorticity training topic this morning, and we're going to primarily focus our attention on vorticity advection. All right, so what exactly is vorticity advection? It is simply a change in the advection values over a particular area. So you're getting a change in vorticity values over time. Now there are three types of vorticity advection that we'll talk about today. We'll talk about what's known as positive vorticity advection, then negative vorticity advection, and finally we'll talk about neutral vorticity advection. And how does this vorticity advection impact our vertical air motion is the most important thing I want you to get out of part two here of the vorticity training. All right, so first things first, let's go ahead and take a look at vorticity advection. Now it's most widely used on the 500 millibar vorticity chart. We can analyze for vorticity advection using this type of chart. Now I did some digging and unfortunately I don't have an example to show you in particular this morning like I wanted to. I was going through some of my hand analysis weather charts from when I was like going through the meteorology course and unfortunately that's not one of them. I got to do some more digging. Um, perhaps I can still find it um, but I do have it somewhere. <laughs> I just got to find out where. Uh, but I have some nice examples on these hand analysis that I did on the 500 millibar vorticity chart, you know, what does a vort max look like? What does a vort min look like? What color do we put positive vorticity advection in? What color do we put negative vorticity advection in? And there's going to be something that's called the XN relationship. You know, um, that would also be on that 500 millibar vorticity chart. So I'm going to have to do some digging and hopefully I can find that and uh, perhaps show you an example of a 500 millibar vorticity chart. Now, vorticity charts are going to use several symbols and I'd be showing you this at the end of this training lecture if I had them. Um, the X on a vorticity chart represents a vorticity maxima or the area where you have your highest positive vorticity. Your highest positive vorticity value is represented by the letter X. The letter N, on a 500 millibar vorticity chart, it's going to represent a vorticity minimum or the place where the vorticity is most negative. So we have X, we have N, X is vort max, and N is vort min. Now, when we talk about positive vorticity advection itself, PVA, this occurs when higher vorticity advection values are going to replace lower values over a given point at a given location. There's more positive vorticity numbers with PVA. There's more positive vorticity numbers that replace the less positive ones. And PVA is common ahead of vorticity maximum and behind vorticity minimums, but can occur anywhere. And again, I should say that what we're looking at here when we talk about positive vorticity advection and negative vorticity advection, we're going to be looking at the 500 millibar chart, okay? We're gonna be looking at generally 18,000 feet above the ground, and we're going to be associating these areas of positive vorticity advection and negative vorticity advection. We're going to associate those with shortwave troughs and shortwave ridges at 500 millibars. All right, so let's take a look at things here. Now, why do we care about positive vorticity advection or PVA? Why does it matter? Well, PVA is an indicator of divergence aloft. So we get upper level divergence. We talked about the chimney effect in past training videos. So we have upper level divergence aloft, and then we get upward vertical air motion, UVM, from the surface to replace the mass, the air, the mass of the column being lost aloft for, um, due to divergence. We have upper vertical motion from the surface. And it's significant because you get rising air motion or upper vertical motion, and that generally equates to bad weather from when generally forming beneath these areas of positive vorticity advection. All right, let me, sh let me show you an example again of the chimney effect. I just want to rehash it with everybody. 
if this is the surface here, okay, and when we say we have PVA as an indicator of divergence aloft, let's just say we're looking at this specific air column right here, okay, in the vertical. We have divergence aloft. That means we're losing mass aloft in the air column, okay? So we're having mass taken out of the air column at the top of it. As a result, we must have air that converges at the surface or in the low levels of the atmosphere. And once it converges, it's going to rise upward. So we have UVM, upper vertical motion in this case. And when we get rising air motion, we're going to get clouds and usually some sort of precipitation or bad weather, okay? And that's why we wanna look at this. Now let's look at the diagram here on the right. All right, so remember what I said this X represented, right? That's your vorticity maximum. This is your location where the vorticity values are reaching their highest positive values. That's what the X represents here. All right, now notice what's ahead of this vorticity maximum. We have an area of PVA or positive vorticity advection. And then behind this vort maximum, behind this letter X, we have negative vorticity advection at 500 millibars. So why do we care about it? I mean, you clearly see beneath these particular areas of PVA and NVA why we care. Because beneath the area of PVA, we have this area of low pressure at the surface. And beneath this area of NVA on the left, we have downward vertical motion associated with high pressure at the surface. So we would have fair weather associated with this letter H, the high pressure beneath the NVA, and we'd have bad weather underneath this area of PVA associated with low pressure, upward vertical motion. All right, so hopefully that makes sense when we look at PVA. Now, why do we care? Let me go ahead and erase this. I wanna show you one other thing here before we move on. Let me erase what I did here. Okay. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention here about this particular um, vorticity analysis is at 500 millibars, 18,000 feet above the ground, the air is going to be, the wind is basically going to be blowing parallel to these height contours, okay? There's no friction turning these winds at all. So if you, if you look, let's just say um, you're at this location, let's just say you're at this location I represent with the letter X, all right, your vorticity value is about 12 or slightly less than that. Let's say your vorticity value at this X is 10. This wind at 500 millibars is going to send these higher or more positive vorticity values into your area at this point. Um, so the max vorticity value is 18. All right, that's going to get blown towards where this letter X is. So that's what's going to result in that positive vorticity advection. I just wanted to show you that. With negative vorticity advection, on the other hand, this occurs when lower or more negative vorticity values replace higher or more positive values. And NVA, negative vorticity advection, is usually common ahead of vorticity minimums, um, the letter N on the vorticity chart, right? And behind vorticity maximums, the vort max, the letter X on the vorticity chart, but can occur anywhere. Right, so with NVA, I'll just call it NVA at this point for negative vorticity advection, um, it's an indicator of upper level convergence and downward vertical motion in the atmosphere. Significant in that high pressure systems and fair weather generally are gonna form beneath areas of NVA. So let's go ahead and draw out the damper effect again as a review, right? So what we have is the air column, once again, this vertical air column above or at the top of the air column we have now, we have air converging, upper level convergence. See how these air streams are meeting? And as these air streams meet, the air will sink in the vertical downward towards the ground or towards the surface. This is an association with DVM downward vertical motion. And then once this airstream, this downward vertical motion reaches the surface, it's going to spread out and we get low level divergence of the surface. This is gonna be associated, this is the damper effect here on the left, okay? And it's associated with high pressure and fair weather. Now, before I draw out this whole PVA, NVA business, first of all, I'm going to get rid of the extra P, I don't know why that showed up, but Let's examine this 500 millibar chart and let's see what's happening at this point X here, okay? What's gonna happen here, all right? 
the winds are going to blow parallel to these solid dark lines, these height contours, because there's no friction up at 18,000 feet or 500 millibars. All right, so what's going to happen here? Um, right now, let's say your value for vorticity is, uh, let's just say it's 18, a value of 18 here at point X, okay? Well, as this wind blows parallel to these dark solid lines, these height contours, it's going to send lower values. This 12 is going to be moving into the area that currently has a vorticity value of 18. So my vorticity values are decreasing over time. We're going from 18 presently, and then eventually we're going to go to 16, 14, and then 12. So this vort min represented by the vorticity minimum or vort min represented by this letter N on a vorticity chart has a vorticity value of 12. So you can kind of see what happens here. The winds are blowing parallel to these height contours. This is a great example of NVA out ahead of a vorticity minimum. We're sending lower vorticity values towards one particular location. And you notice over here on the left, we have positive vorticity advection to the left, or basically to the west in the northern hemisphere, if you want to say it that way, to the left or west of the vorticity minimum. Okay, so if you were, let's say, at this location where I put the X just to, just to the left of the N, the Wortman, you have a vorticity value of 12. Well, that wind is going to blow in these higher vorticity values. With time, your vorticity values will increase on the back side of this vorticity minimum from, from 12 to 14 to 16. So you're increasing your values. That's positive vorticity advection. And again, these areas of PVA and NVA, these are all associated with either upward vertical motion, rising air in the atmosphere with clouds and precipitation, or sinking, NVA, sinking air motion in the atmosphere associated with fair weather or high pressure. Um, so it's important to take a look at these. It's very important. And then again, they're associated with shortwave ridges and shortwave troughs in the atmosphere. Now, what happens when we don't have any kind of vorticity advection. In this case, now recall that, now this is 552 decameters, this is 558 decameters, this is 564 decameters. These are lines of equal height, iso heights, or height contours, at 500 millibars. The winds are blowing parallel to these height contours, right? This 08 represents a vorticity value, this 06 represents a vorticity value, but if the winds are blowing parallel to these height contours, right, we're not going to get any kind of vorticity advection to occur. And this is a case of what's called neutral vorticity advection. And it can happen in a couple different ways. Uh, it occurs with calm winds. It can occur with weak vorticity gradients, which you typically see in the summertime. Or parallel wind flow, like I'm showing here on the right. These arrows represent the wind flow. They're parallel to the vorticity isopleth this dashed line. They're also parallel to the height contours. It's quite common to see this during the summer, as I mentioned, neutral vorticity advection, very weak vorticity gradients. Uh, neutral vorticity advection is not analyzed, but it generally indicates that you will have neither upper level convergence or upper level divergence. So basically what we're saying with this is you, neutral vorticity advection, you're really not going to get much in the way of significant weather patterns. Now let's examine vorticity advection and the jet stream maxima. Sometimes we call this a jet streak, right? Those jet streaks are just accelerated regions of wind speed within the jet. So when we look at these jet stream maximums or jet streaks from above, the left of the polar front jet is the cold or cyclonic side where you get air parcels spinning cyclonically. Um, so here, let me draw this out. As we talk about this, I'll draw this out so you kind of get a feel for it. All right, so let's say that this is, let's just say that this, this represents my jet stream, okay? This is my jet stream. This is my river of air in the upper atmosphere, okay? All right, so this is my jet. Left of the polar front jet is the colder cyclonic side. So we're gonna have positive vorticity advection to the left of the polar front jet. Now remember the winds are blowing like this, so that's why we say left of it. Okay, so this is a positive vorticity area. The air parcels are spinning cyclonically to the left of the polar front jet. Now to the right of the polar front jet is the warmer anticyclonic side. Well, you guessed it, air parcels to the right of the polar front jet stream are gonna be rotating anticyclonically. 
and that is going to result in negative vorticity over here on the left, to, on the right of the jet stream. So positive vorticity to the left of the polar front jet, negative vorticity to the right of the polar front jet. And then within this jet stream, you have these jet maximums, which are divided into four quadrants. We have a left front quadrant, a right front quadrant, a left rear quadrant, and a right rear quadrant. And let me draw that out for you here so you hopefully you understand it better. Let me go ahead and erase this. I'm going to redraw out my jet stream, my polar front jet. Here's my pen. Okay. So here's my river of air in the upper atmosphere. And it's going to be, I'm trying to represent it with this arrow, and I apologize. <laughs> it's not the best drawing here. But within this jet stream axis, you have what's known as a jet streak, okay? We'll call this JS for jet streak, or let's just call it JM. We'll go with the title here, or with the slide, and call it jet maximum. So JM represents jet maximum. This is an accelerated region of wind speeds within the jet axis itself, and it's divided into four quadrants. We have a left front quadrant. We have a right front quadrant. So that's RF. We have a left rear quadrant. And then we have a right rear quadrant. I think I may have it on the next slide here, but I just kind of want to draw it out for you. That's how we divide up these jet maximums or jet streaks in a specific quadrants. Here it is right here. I probably should have just waited. But bottom line here is if you were to divide up, we're getting at a couple points here, right? This is your jet maximum or jet streak. If you divide it up into four quadrants, and that's what we're doing here. So here's my line here right down the middle. And then I would have another line right here. This is my four quadrants. So I have a left front quadrant. I have a right front quadrant. I have a left rear quadrant, and then I have the right rear quadrant. That's what I was trying to draw out for you in the previous slide. All right, and I remember on the to the left of the polar front jet, you have positive vorticity. It's the air parcel is spinning cyclonically on the cold side to the left of the polar front jet. And then you have negative vorticity to the right of this polar front jet, and that's going to be associated on the warm side, anticyclonic spinning of the air parcel. So hopefully you have this down now. Now, I will say that NWS, National Weather Service, in their discussions, you'll see them talk about the left or right entrance regions, okay? Um, that would be right where the air parcels initially begin to accelerate within the jet max. Right when it first entered the jet max, they accelerate. Um, that would be the entrance region. And sometimes you'll hear the National Weather Service, uh, or the, you'll read their discussions, and it'll say the jet max, the... Um, the exit region of the jet max, okay? And that's gonna be on the other side. But this is a nice breakdown of what a jet maxima looks like. We divide it into four quadrants and uh, we have the entrance region, the exit region, yeah. All right, so now let's take a look at vorticity of action associated with these jet stream maxima. Let's just say the winds are blowing straight. There's no curved flow in the atmosphere. So if you have no curvature, you have no curvature vorticity, right? Remember, we talked about that in part one of the vorticity training. If you change the winds around the jet stream maximum, though, you create this shear, and this is going to result in that shear vorticity. Uh, vorticity. So you get shear vorticity when the winds within the jet maximum change. Shear is going to occur along the length of the jet, but is greatest just to the right or left of the jet stream maximum. And we talked about that previously with using the river and the canoe as an example, whether the flow of that river was stronger to the left or to the right of the canoe. In this case, we're looking at the jet stream maximum, whether the winds are stronger or weaker to the right or left of the actual jet stream maximum. Uh, on the cyclonic side to the left, the shear results in positive shear vorticity. Okay, so get positive shear vorticity to the left of the jet stream maximum on the cyclonic side. And then on the anti-cyclonic side to the right of the jet stream maximum, this shear results in negative vortis shear vorticity. All right, so here is an example of, of vorticity advection in the jet stream maximum of straight line winds. Again, there's no curve flow. There's no curve flow in this example on the left. There's nothing, it's straight line wind flow. Um, notice we have a 100 knot jet maximum here. This is the speed of the jet max in the center of it, 100 knots. And then we have shear because 
Why do we have shear in this example here on the left? Because we have a change in wind speed over a distance to the right and to the left of this 100 knot value, the jet stream maximum itself. We have different differing wind speeds resulting in shear vorticity. All right. Um, so just wanted to show you kind of what it would look like. You notice how we go from 100 knots in the jet stream maximum down to 50 knots uh, on the to the left of the jet stream maximum on the cold side. Generally, though, just keep in mind that we're going to have positive shear vorticity to the left due to these varying wind speeds changing over short distances at 300 millibars or about 30,000 feet. And to the right of the jet stream maximum over here, we're going to have negative shear vorticity. Just keep that in mind. So vorticity advection, jet stream maximum, straight line flow, we get these distinct patterns uh, of vorticity that are called shear lobes. Uh, on both sides of the jet stream maximum are areas of significant shear as those wind speeds change over shorter distances. On the cyclonic side of the jet stream maximum, the vort max appears, and this is going to be represented by the letter X. We talked about the X representing the vorticity maximum or vort max. That's going to be to the left of the jet stream maximum. And on the anticyclonic side of the jet stream maximum, there's going to be the vorticity minimum, vort min which appears represented by the letter N. And then finding the XN relationship, by the way, is a great way to find a jet maximum on the 300 millibar chart. Um, you would associate it with those higher wind speeds in the 300 millibar chart. But if you look at a 500 millibar vorticity chart, you can actually connect the X and N vertically, and that was, is gonna be a good indicator of a jet stream maximum. So bottom line here, let me draw this out for you. Let me erase this first. I want to show you this real quick. Uh, let me erase this. All right, this is an example again. Let's take a look and get my pen back out. And I want to show you this. So generally what you're going to have to indicate a jet stream maximum on a 500 millibar vorticity chart is you're going to have the letter X here, which is your vorticity maximum, highest positive vorticity value. And then down here, you're going to have a letter N which represents your minimum vorticity value, the lowest vorticity values. And then the way you would analyze it on a 500 millibar vorticity chart then is you would connect the X to the N like this. You would draw a vertical line from the X on the cyclonic side of the jet stream maximum to the N on the anti-cyclonic side or to the right of the jet stream maximum. And this would be an indicator on a 500 millibar vorticity chart that you have a jet stream maximum. In, in existence. This is it right here on the right. Uh, again, this is straight line flow. So we're not, we're not talking about curved flow at this point, but moving in a Z pattern from left rear to, I'm sorry, from left rear quadrant, there we go. Moving in a Z pattern from the left rear quadrant of the jet maximum to the, to the right rear front yields the NVA, PVA, PVA, NVA pattern, or Upper level convergence, upper level divergence, upper level convergence. Um, I'm sorry. Upper level convergence, upper level divergence, upper level divergence, upper level convergence. I know it could be it could get kind of confusing here, but what we're doing is we're doing a letter Z pattern here, like this. We're, we're creating a letter Z, and and remember this is the this is the left front quadrant over here of the jet maximum, and this would be the left rear quadrant over here. And then this one over here would be your right front quadrant of the jet maximum. And then we would have the right rear over here. So what we're trying to show you here with any kind of jet stream maximum and straight line flow, we have a distinct up, a pattern. In the left front quadrant of a jet stream maximum, we have positive vorticity evaction, upper level divergence. So that would mean in the left front quadrant, the air wants to rise. Uh, in the right front quadrant, we have negative vorticity advection or upper level convergence, which means the air is going to want to sink in the right front quadrant of this jet stream maximum. In the left rear quadrant, we also have NVA or upper level convergence, which is going to indicate downward vertical motion. And in the right rear quadrant, we have positive vorticity advection or upper level divergence, which indicates rising air motion. So there's a distinct pattern of PVA and NVA associated with each of these jet stream maximum quadrants. And it's important as a forecaster, you wanna analyze with a jet stream maximum in particular, you wanna analyze 
where these areas are in relation to your location. So if you're directly beneath the left front quadrant of a jet stream maximum, or directly beneath the right rear quadrant of a jet stream maximum, you're gonna have upper level positive uh, vorticity advection, upper level divergence, okay? That's gonna give you more clouds and precipitation, more storminess if you're in the left front quadrant or the right rear quadrant. If you're beneath, located beneath the right front or the left rear quadrant, you're probably gonna have fair weather because the air is sinking vertically and that results in more fair weather and high pressure. So you see the distinctive patterns here. Here's my XN, right? I, I just showed you that on the previous slide. But if you look at a 500 millibar vorticity chart, you wanna identify a potential area of, of accelerated wind speeds within the jet stream, these jet stream maximum. You want to connect your vorticity maximum letter X, draw the vertical line straight down to your letter N vorticity minimum. And this is going to give you potential clue as to where you have a jet stream maximum at 300 millibars. So it's a nice little tool you can use. Um, again, you have to divide up these, these accelerated wind speeds within the jet stream and determine which quadrant you're beneath because that's going to tell you whether you have clouds or, or clear skies, really, whether you have storminess or whether you have fair weather. Now, what happens if we have curved cyclonic flow? We're gonna now change things up to show curve flow. If you add curvature and shear vorticity to yield relative vorticity, this may not be as clear cut as when it is as it is with straight line wind flow that I just showed you. Shear and curvature vorticity may work together or actually work against each other. In the left front and left rear quadrants of the jet stream maximum, shear and curvature vorticity work together, resulting in a strong vorticity field. In the right front and right rear quadrants of jet stream maximum, it is difficult to assess the relative vorticity pattern. You could have a case where shear and curvature vorticity work together or offset or against each other, or one may be stronger than the other. Let me show you an example in curved cyclonic flow here. All right, so we have our vorticity maximum represented by the letter X. We have PBA and upper level divergence out ahead of this vorticity maximum. Um, we have for, uh, NVA, negative vorticity vector, upper level convergence behind the vort max, the letter X. And on the cyclonic side, this solid dark arrow represents your jet stream axis. This is your polar front jet stream axis. Notice that it's pretty much a slam dunk when you have shear. You have the shear. Remember we said that to the left of the polar front jet, the shear vorticity is positive, right? To the left of this jet axis here, the solid dark arrow. And we also know that in a trough, curvature vorticity is positive. So we have both shear and curvature vorticity working together, yielding a positive relative vorticity. So a positive REL, relative vorticity, to the left of this jet stream axis. Shear and curvature are working together, they're both positive. But on the right hand side, if I go to the right of the jet stream axis, uh-oh, I got a problem here. I know that curvature, perhaps, these are offsetting each other because I know, for example, curvature is positive in a trough, right? But shear vorticity is negative to the right side of the polar front jet stream axis. So in this case, my letter S represents shear and my letter C represents curvature. So to the right of the jet stream, the polar front jet stream axis, curvature vorticity is positive because we're still dealing with the trough but shear vorticity is negative. So if you have a negative and a positive, we really don't know the end result of what the relative vorticity is gonna be. We have to examine other parameters to identify, hey, is one stronger than the other? Um, what about my upper level height falls or rises? Is my, are my upper level heights rising or falling? That's gonna give us a clue as to what's going on at these, at these particular location. So I wanted to kind of show you that example. So we have everything working together on the cyclonic side or to the left of the polar front jet stream axis, um, you know, to the out ahead of this vorticity maximum, we have positive vorticity advection, rising air motion, upper level divergence, most likely clouds and precipitation. 
And then on the left side of, to the left or to the west of this Fort Max, we have NVA, upper level convergence, negative vorticity evection. The air is gonna be sinking here. It's going to be rising there. And it's pretty clear cut. Both shear and curvature vorticity on the cyclonic side or to the left of the polar front jet stream axis are working together to give us positive relative vorticity. But again, to the right or the anticyclonic side of the jet stream axis, we just don't know. What about in curved anticyclonic flow? When the jet stream maximum is an anticyclonic flow, the curvature vorticity reinforces shear vorticity on the anticyclonic side, resulting in a strong vorticity field. But to the left of the jet stream maximum, there may not be any spin, depending on the strength of the shear and curvature vorticity. So again, it's a case of examining the situation. Um, shear and curvature vorticity may work together. They may work against each other or offset each other or one may be stronger than the other. Here we go. Anticyclonic curvature now, okay? Anticyclonically curved flow. This is gonna be associated with upper level ridges. We have our vorticity minimum represented by the letter N. We have our area of NVA out ahead of this Vortman NVA, negative vorticity vection, upper level convergence. Behind the Vortman, the letter N here, we have positive vorticity vection or upper level divergence. So the air wants to rise with PVA and upper level divergence. Air wants to sink out ahead of the Vortman associated with negative vorticity evection and upper level convergence. So when you're talking to, if this, let's say this dark arrow again represents my polar front jet stream axis, everything works great because uh, to the right of this polar front jet stream axis within the ridge itself, Let's examine things we have. Okay, we'll have negative shear vorticity, so negative for letter S, and we have negative curvature vorticity, right? Letter C. That is going to give us negative, I'll make it an R this time for relative vorticity. All right, so this is no problem when we're talking with anticyclonically curved flow and we're talking about you know, all the vorticity to the right of this polar front jet stream axis. We have shear negative and we have curvature negative. So negative shear plus negative curvature gives us negative relative. But if we go to the left of the polar front jet stream axis, basically on to the left of this ridge, the center of this ridge where the jet stream winds are to the left of that, what is shear gonna be like over here to the left? Okay, curvature is going to be negative but shear is gonna be positive. So letter S represents shear and it's positive. We have positive shear vorticity to the left of this polar front jet stream axis associated with anticyclonically curved flow. And we also, and when we look at curvature vorticity in a, in a ridge, it's negative. So we really don't know. We take a positive plus a negative. We really don't know what the relative vorticity is gonna to be to the left of this anticyclonically curved flow to the left of the ridge, I mean, the main jet stream winds associated with the ridge. So that's the real problem here. You'd have to, again, assess the upper level heights. You have to assess to see, you know, hey, maybe the curvature is stronger than the shear, or maybe the shear is stronger than the curvature. Um, but it, that's how you have to identify things overall. All right, that wraps up part two of the vorticity training. I wanted to get this in on this Saturday morning. Uh, what did we talk about today? We talked about vorticity advection. This is hugely important when we talk about how the atmosphere is three-dimensional from the surface all the way up through the vertical levels, okay? So when we get changes of vorticity advection or changes of vorticity values over time blown about by those upper level winds, this is either going to favor positive vorticity advection, negative vorticity advection, or neutral vorticity advection. Um, Generally, we're going to use the 500 millibar vorticity chart to analyze vorticity advection and letter X. By the way, that letter X is typically in red. It represents a vorticity maximum or area where the highest positive vorticity value is located. The letter N, by the way, is going to be blue. It represents a vorticity minimum or the place where the vorticity value is the most negative. We talked about PVA. It's just simply when you get higher vorticity advection values replacing lower values at a given location. And PVA is gonna be common ahead of vort maxes, the letter X on the vorticity chart. 
and, and it's going to also positive vorticity of action will occur behind vorticity minimums, the blue ends on the vorticity chart. And I really, really wanted to really drive home the importance of vorticity infection here because PVA ahead of vort maxes and, and behind vort mins is associated with upward vertical motion in the atmosphere, um, low level converging air, low pressure, clouds and precipitation is associated with PVA, while NVA is associated with fair weather and high pressure. Sinking air motion, downward vertical air motion associated with NVA. Over here on the left, we talked about the chimney effect. Uh, we talked about the chimney effect over there on the left. Upper level divergence, air mass being removed at the top of the column, being replaced by converging air in the lower levels of the column. Uh, negative vorticity vection occurs when lower or more negative vorticity values replace higher or more positive vorticity values. Again, remember, NVA is common ahead of vorticity minimum, Fortman's, the blue N on the vorticity chart, and behind vorticity maximum, the red X. Here's the opposite pattern when we talk about this letter N on the right. Um, this is going to be associated with vorticity minimum. The lowest vorticity value is here at the letter N, and you have lower vorticity values moving into an area. This is negative vorticity vection ahead of the Vortman, this letter N. And then we have positive vorticity vection, higher po uh, vorticity values moving in behind as this moves through. Again, now I want you to think about this. The vorticity maximum areas are associated with shortwave troughs and your vorticity minimums are associated with shortwave ridges in the, in the upper atmosphere, specifically at 500 millibars. If we get neutral vorticity vection, the wind's blowing parallel to both the height contours and these vorticity isopleths, these lines of equal vorticity value. So you're really not going to get much in the way of weather associated with neutral vorticity advection. Primarily occurs in the summertime. Uh, again, wind is blowing parallel to both, both of those lines, vorticity isopleths and height contours. Also occurs when you have calmer winds. Um, and then we examine vorticity advection jet stream maximums. Uh, we know that vorticity is going to be positive to the left of the of the jet stream axis on the cold cyclonic side, and vorticity is going to be negative to the right of the jet stream maximum on the anticyclonic warm side. We divided up this jet stream maximum or this jet streak into four quadrants: left front, right rear, left rear, and right rear. Uh, the Weather Service will use the term entrance regions and exit regions in their discussions. Um, entrance region is where the air parcels are coming in and accelerating into the jet maximum. And then the exit region is where the air is starting, the air parcels are decelerating or slowing down coming out of the jet stream maximum. Straight line flow, we examine the vorticity vection in association with straight line flow. We don't have any curvature vorticity to consider in straight line wind flow. Uh, we only have shear vorticity to consider. And on the cyclonic side to the left of the jet stream maximum and straight line flow, your shear vorticity is positive. And on the anticyclonic side to the right, the shear vorticity is negative. And then we talked about distinct patterns of vorticity that you would see on the vorticity chart at 500 millibars. These are called shear lows. And you can identify the jet stream maximum on a 500 millibar chart when you connect the letter X with the letter N, the vort max with the vort min, um, and generally you're gonna have your jet stream maximums kind of like running right in the middle of that vertical line that you draw. That's called the XN relationship. And we also see distinct patterns of NVA and PVA or upper level convergence and upper level divergence associated with the quadrants of these jet stream maximums. And then finally, we talked about curved cyclonic flow, and then we talked about curved anticyclonic flow. How do you assess vorticity in those situations, which we have happened quite a bit in the atmosphere as troughs and ridges move into and out of an area. I really love this topic. It's very complex. I try to break it down simple for you, even for those at home watching this video that really don't know a lot about meteorology. You know, it, it's a tricky concept to grasp, honestly. I remember going through it for the first time, learning about this relationships between vort maxes, vort mins, PVA and NVA areas, whether the air is rising or sinking. But this is a very important concept, <clears throat> especially during the fall and winter season when you have a much stronger upper level winds associated with your jet stream. 
And you really need to assess, you know, hey, what quadrant of the jet maximum am I beneath? Am I under the left front or right rear? If that's the case, my air is most likely rising in the atmosphere vertically. I'm going to have clouds and precipitation beneath that left front and right rear quadrant of the jet max or the jet stream maximum. If I'm in the, in the right front or the left rear, I'm most likely going to have sinking air motion and high pressure and fair weather. So it's a very important concept to grasp. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope I wasn't going too, too fast. That's all I got for now, everybody. I've got much more on the way as far as the training video series. Um, I'm going to talk about atmospheric waves um, soon. We'll talk about how cyclones develop and go through various stages of development as well. That's another upcoming training video. So I really hope you like this training video. Please feel free to give me comments. I'm always open to comments on how to improve the training. Um, I try my best to really break things down. And that's all I got for now, everybody. I hope everybody has an awesome, awesome weekend. And until next time, take care and God bless everyone. Thank you.